This is uh, and just a, something a bit different for me. It's purely a watercolor, a, a watercolor piece really, without any line work. It's quite subtle in terms of the uh, overall feel of the of the reference image. As you can see now, that's at the the top right corner there, the no, top left corner there. So even though it's uh, it's watercolor only, you know, I'm still going to put in just a, a few simple pencil lines, just to give me a guide and a a sort of sense of uh, of the image. Again, this is another one of my watercolor. Um, this is so again. This is another lighthouse drawing. I often think anything to do with the seaside or or anything vaguely maritime is something I'm always drawn to, really. And um, I think you know lighthouses of such iconic structures. Uh, you know they represent uh, the sort of land-based side of the uh, uh, of the adventure, if you know what I mean. And often lighthouses tend to be on isolated headlands and tend to be surrounded by quite interesting coastlines and this one has a nice lead in for the path which has a sense of slightly exaggerated perspective about it I think the way that I've tried to draw it um, it's a sort of boardwalk almost and these simple sort of areas of uh, foliage really I think one of the things I struggled with slightly with this image is the is the light. I believe it, it's sort of a dusk type image. It may well be dawn, but it feels a little bit like dusk to me. Um, and often with that, uh, with those times of days, you have to have an overall sort of tone and feel to the image, and and that c can mean that the, the there's a sort of united color palette of you know, purples or, or blues or whatever. And um, and really here it was just a case of, sort of playing, uh, starting as I, in one place and seeing where it took me. But in, in retrospect, it probably would have been good to to get a spare, spare sheet of paper and just do some, try some different colour mixes and just see what felt right for this particular image. But one of the things that I do in my art is I often sit down, look at a picture and go, oh, I like that, and I'll just... You know, I'll start working my way through it. And that means there's no pressure. That means there's no, not a lot of planning. Because often, you know, I don't really know what I'm painting until I sit down and look at my tablet and I'll, I'll go through some reference images and go, well, oh, I fancy doing that tonight. And that's actually quite a nice way of working too, you know. Unless you're working on commissions or you have, you know, specific things you're doing for an exhibition or something like that, then, you know, it's quite nice just to be a bit free with it, really. Now, you may have noticed that I used my set square here to make sure that I got the lighthouse horizontal. Not horizontal, vertical. Horizontal wouldn't work for a lighthouse. Um, and that and that's simply for the fact that... And that's simply for the fact that and recently I have drawn a few things where I've noticed that the, uh, uh, the verticals have been way off. Um, no, and I quite like sketches. I quite like rough sketches, but... I have a bit of a pet hatred for, um, you know, for like exaggerated perspectives or uh, or when you look at a series of buildings and they're all wonky. You know, I think wonky as a style is fine um, if it's all wonky and it's really wonky. But when something's just a little off, and I mean a little off, I think it does tend to, uh, it does tend to look a, a little bit wrong. Now, I, I don't notice it in other people's work. This is just purely my own. So I've been trying to be just a bit more careful about at least getting the verticals right. Again here I'm not going crazy about you know adding in uh, the correct amount of stripes. <gasps> or even thinking too particularly about um, the you know the sort of dimensions or anything. Is it's 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 just to get the feel for for the lighthouse. So I do hope you are uh, sketching along along with me here and that you've uh, downloaded the image from my website. 
Um, there's a link in the description below. As with all these um, pieces that I do, there's always a link in the description. You can go to my website, you can download the full-size image, stick it on a tablet, you put it on the second screen if you've got it, print it out if you need to. And, you know, I want you to be sketching along with me here. Because um, the idea of... Um, of art, you know, particularly when you're on your own and you're at home, it's, it can be a bit solitary. And I love the idea of uh, of me being a little bit of juntering company for someone. That would be a that would be a genuine privilege, really. Um, you know, I often listen to podcasts and things when I'm sketching, but if I could actually draw alongside someone, or or you could have a sketch along with me, that would be uh, that would be great. So here. What I'm really doing is I'm just thinking about this sky and I'm putting in a little bit of blue. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of yellow in. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to leave a little bit of separation between sort of church and state. I'm not going to be pushing that yellow deep into that blue because you know what's going to happen if you mix yellow and blue. So... Uh, you're going to get a green band in the sky. So that, I mean, that may well be there in reality. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just keep those things a little bit separate and then pull in a little bit of that uh, rose. It's interesting what, you know, looking back at these, because the, I did these probably a few weeks ago now. And I'm already going, you are going to put some sienna in there, aren't you? Uh, and obviously I don't. Um, but it's it's really interesting how uh, yeah I guess that's the thing about this kind of sort of painting off the hoof is you know it's going to turn out different every time because the very nature of it is pretty flea, flea flowing yeah you know what I mean I don't really know what I'm trying to achieve here, but it's it's not going my way. I'll tell you that much. I think what I've done is I've created a, a, a light bit and then another dark bit, and then I've had to put another little wash over the top, and then I've got it on all the other pages of the notepad, and then I've got my finger stuck on it. Anyway, and then I've hair dried it. So it's turned out okay in the end. And again, that's probably, if you look at the reference drawing, if anything, that's a bit too subtle. I could have gone a bit bolder with, with those sky tones. Because as I always say, once it's dried, is it, you know, you lose half of the pigment, really. It feels like it just disappears. And again, that depends on the paper as well, quite a lot. Okay, so we're going to start on the ground here. So I'm going to be, uh, I've chosen to use quite a sort of bluey, uh, uh, bluey green here. Um, and I'm starting to sort of block in some colour. It is interesting there that I've started with the back of the foreground rather than the fore of the foreground. Um, yeah, that is interesting. And also, I've actually started with what is quite a deep, uh, cold blue, cold, uh, cold green, and not with something slightly warmer, and then made it colder. If you know what I mean. So I'm trying here not to leave some space for the woodwork for the boardwalk. It might be worth here talking a little bit more about watercolour paper. Um, now this, as I mentioned in a previous tutorial, this isn't high grade watercolour paper. These pink pig pads, I think this is a, a thick cartridge paper. It's excellent paper for the money and it's really, it's good enough for, uh, for playing with watercolour. But it doesn't quite have some of the characteristics that the very thick watercolour paper, 100% cotton watercolour paper has. Um, so here I'm using a rigger brush just to create a little bit of texture in the uh, 
in the far background uh, the texture of these reeds and uh, and these sort of plant tops so one of the things you'll notice about um, this paper is it is it just it can sort of clump up the pigment can clump up on the surface I'm not 100% sure whether that's just the texture of this paper or whether it's something to do with how it's made. Okay. So I think what I've done there is that's I've created quite a nice base layer. I thought initially that the background was going to be a little bit dark, but actually that's going to dry quite nicely because obviously it's going to dry a lot lighter. And it means that there's going to be scope in the foreground to put in a lot more grass texture. Um, when you're creating uh, layers and layers of construction with watercolour, obviously because the layers are semi-transparent, you have to start quite light. Because if you go in with a lot of pigment, first of all, you can only get one or two layers over the top of it. You don't really have a lot of choice. Whereas if your initial layer is relatively opaque, it means that you can um, you can go over the top and then go over the top again, etc. So that's what I'm doing here. I've created some, uh, again, a, a patch of colour on the right-hand side, but I'm using the same wash that I have just made, which is a slightly different tone, to start to build up some different textures on the far left as well. And again, I'm leaving some negative space for the sand in in this uh, this particular picture because that's going to be lighter again. What would have made sense actually looking at this now would have would be to do the sand directly after the sky because that's a a, a a similar tone in a weird way to some of the blues in the sky at the top or certainly some of them at the bottom where it's slightly purple so really the logical thing to do after the sky would have been the sand you can do it at the end but it did it, it wasn't it wasn't a very uh, it wasn't the right way around to do that if you know what I mean I think for me, one of the uh, the nice things about line and wash technique is, is it it's painting by numbers is um, uh, is perhaps a little bit of an insult to what is as valued and and valid a form of art as for me uh, as oils or acrylics or whatever. You know, I I, don't, I think line and wash is quite easy to demigrate because uh, it's a very simple process, but I think we tend to um, we tend to forget that you can have a lot of variation in line line widths and line characteristics that can add an awful lot of interest and embellishment to a picture as well as you know you can color it in any number of ways um, but one of the things about line and washes technique is is it tends to to be separate elements in a weird way so there is a lot of uh, comfort in a way in having some decent chunky lines to hang a picture on Whereas when you're working this way, which is obviously the traditional watercolour method, you know, with a little bit of pencil and, and then just your paints, it, it, I actually find it in many ways a lot harder. Uh, maybe not as enjoyable in a weird way. My problem is I love drawing. I just, I love drawing. I always have. And for all that in the last five years, I've, you know, come a long way with my watercolour. And, uh, and with inks and different techniques, you know, I still keep going back to just the simple power of drawing. Um, one of the things I used to use a lot in my drawing career was markers. I keep thinking about going back to those markers. I, I reckon if I smelt a alcohol marker now, it would send me off on some kind of Madeline moment. You know, I'd be the very, uh, very Proustian. So yeah, I find one of the things I find about actual watercolor watercolors like this is it is very, it does force you to 
to work quite slowly. Uh, you cannot bang things on top of other things. You know, you have to let things dry. And um, you have to start thinking about whether you want things to granulate or, you know, do you want things to dry naturally or you know, hit them with the hairdryer or, or whatever. So again, I'm just trying to add some texture here. I'm using my rigger brush and just trying to uh, add in some, tell some stories with some little lines. So I'm taking some of the um, the darker bits of pigment that are perhaps a little bit too heavy handed and I'm using that rigger and while it's still a little bit wet I'm just pushing that it, that around a bit um, and I'm using those puddles to sort of collect a little bit of the pigment and add it in some different places. You can see it's starting to even with a two re or maybe maximum of three layers on sort of some of these elements now is it, it is starting to sort of come together you know if you sort of squint at that it feels like it's starting to come together as a picture a little bit there uh, v. v okay so now we're um we've dried that with the hairdryer and uh i'm going on to create some of the the path details now now if you're sketching or drawing along with me here you know please don't feel you have to keep up um i really don't want you to feel rushed so feel free to pause it put some music on catch up or if you're um you know or if you're a lot faster than i am then by all means you know skip ahead um so what i'm trying to do with this um sand texture is i don't want it to be a flat wash i don't want it to be too flat so i'm starting off by adding it in as a, a little bit patchy to begin with and then i'll probably go in and add some shadows i think i do that in a in a little while So the paints that I'm using here are Daniel Smith paints. I follow, um, when I got into watercolour, I started with, like a lot of people, with Winsor & Newton Cotman sets, which are very good. I actually had one from when I was a kid, you know, and I picked that up again and had a play with it. And then I got a more newer version and had a bit of a mess about with that and liked it. And then I quickly uh, diversified to what I recall sort of middle of the road sets. One of them was a uh, St. Petersburg White Knights, which I think, I think a lot of the uh, paints are set with honey. Um, now they activate very quickly, but they're very bright colors. Uh, they're excellent paints, but they're very different to a lot of other watercolors. And uh, I did enjoy using them, but I found that a lot of the colors I was I was getting were were a bit too extraordinary. They weren't very organic, I felt. Um, so I started to look around and I started to look at what other artists were using. And there was a couple of artists whose work I still love to this day, but I, you know, when I got back into my art in a big way, I got pretty obsessed with looking at their stuff on Instagram. And um, one of those artists is a guy called Brian Ramsey. Now he... He uh, has featured on the Sky Arts Landscape Artist of the Year and is, you know, one of the few sort of line and wash people. If you could, He probably wouldn't be comfortable with the term line and wash, I suspect. But um, his line work is tremendous. He's got such a style. There's nobody like Brian Ramsey's work. But he was uh, featured on television and, and got really quite far in the competition. Um He's a fabulous artist, does you know, wonderful portraits as well as landscape stuff. Um, and one of the other artists is uh, John Harrison, who I'm sure you've heard of me talk about before. He's got a nice little YouTube channel. And um, and both of them you know, are big fans of Daniel Smith watercolours. And I, I, after chatting with them about 
what they use and also discovering via Brian really uh, Liz Steele who is an artist who um, is a watercolour and urban sketcher and she has um, L-I-Z-S-T-E-L-E-L she has if you type in Liz Steele palette or Liz Steele watercolour palette um, she has a great website that's dedicated to sort of why she's developed these certain palettes and her favourite colours and how she mixes colours and how she swatches colours. And it's it's quite sort of technical, but she also uh, will lay out what her palettes are and how they've changed in time. And I cribbed, I literally stole her, I think it was 2020, uh, her, one of her more later ones that was the last palette I built. And uh, even though the case is a sminky case, it was... Um, it was slightly modified with some little bits of blue tack and uh, I, uh, I I drilled a couple of holes out the bottom of it so that I could remove the, the little clip and things like that. Basically, it meant I could pack it full of these pans, these full and half pans. And... Um, and yeah, and so what I do now is I just buy I buy Daniel Smith watercolor, buy the uh, tube, and I just fill my own pans, which is dead easy. It's a bit annoying because when I run out of paint, which I do once every you know year and a half, I've got to buy a whole new tube, which is like you know thirty quid or whatever. But it does last a long time. But no, I would recommend Daniel Smith's color. Daniel Smith's colors, watercolors, they're really good, but they are not cheap. And certainly if you're learning, you don't need them. Uh, perfectly good with the Winter and Newton sets. They're really excellent. Uh, I definitely would try and avoid anything that came from, uh, was just too cheap, you know, and didn't come from a reasonably rep reputable manufacturer. Um, certain colours, such as cobalt, um, they are rather toxic, so I wouldn't drink your watercolour water if you're using them. They might make you a bit poorly, but generally they are, you know, pretty, pretty safe. Um, so the difference between cheap and more uh, uh, and expensive watercolors is not just the quality of the paint in terms of how you apply it and how it mixes. It's also to do with how color fast the paint is. You know, how long will it last if it's in the direct sunlight? Um, it's it's it can be how it granulates. Um, it can also be uh, how transparent it is or how staining it is. And as you get more into um, watercolours and, and the sort of science behind it, it can it can get really crazy. I mean, some of the um, some of the paints I've seen people use. Brian, for example, was playing for a while with a a magnetic paint that had iron filings in. And when you put a magnet on the back of the paper, depending on the orientation of the magnet, all the iron filings would follow the, um, you know, the magnetic, uh, uh, what's the term? Is it the magnetic curve? Or it would align with the magnet, basically. So, yeah, I mean, it's amazing what you can get. And there's an awful lot of very, very small manufacturers now that are making super tiny batch, um, you know, pigments, all natural pigment uh, at vast expense, but they're beautiful colours. So in a weird way, I guess, uh, manufacturer of paints is, has returned to how it how it used to be in the sense that it's not just big manufacturers. There is a lot of smaller, you know, kitchens cooking up some really interesting little brews of um, natural colours and, and lots of different stuff. Well, as you can see, we're chuntering on a little bit with this now, as I'm chuntering on with my commentary. I'm, all, I'm look, Even when I'm looking at this now, I'm thinking, oh, I need to go in there with a pen, and <laughs> still, like, I'm not comfortable. There's no lines on it. It's funny, really. Right, so... How are we getting on? Mixing up some colour now for the uh, for the lighthouse. 
Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, I'm scratching my hand here. I'm going to start blocking that in. Hopefully, I'll remember to leave some uh, the light bands, not just colour the whole thing in. Would be the first time I've done that. So I'm looking now and thinking, right, well, the top bit is red. That band's red. Uh, now which bit do I do first? <laughs> I'm already thinking, oh, no, I've done the wrong bit. Oh, no. One of the things I really I do like about watercolor is it is it's actually quite a good base for it's quite a good starting point for a lot of uh, other stuff. You know, on top of watercolor, you can use line work. You can use um, you know some quite harsh lines, or or you can use Posca pens or charcoal or anything really. Um, the only the only issue slightly is that if you work it too much it doesn't go completely fast in the same way that um like a waterproof ink would you know so if you put something over the top of it it's very wet and then push it around a lot it will reactivate the pigment people say that you know once when it once it's dry watercolor it uh you can layer it and you can yes but um if you were to take this page once you'd finish the drawing and run it under the tap for five minutes you wouldn't have much of a drawing left afterwards or it certainly wouldn't be as recognizable so again i'm i'm looking at this and thinking this makes no sense you know i should have put in the what would be the you know the the lighter bands should be in first there so i should have put in the i mean i can't really see from the reference image is it are they yellow are they sort of like tan colored i suspect they're probably a faded white but because of the type of night they look slightly purpley pink so why i've gone in and put the uh the red ones in first i have no idea that makes no sense No matter. Onwards. I mean, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. So it's spring here, uh, nearly, and uh, I'm so looking forward to getting out and doing some actual art in nature. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever uh, do a lot of en plein air, as the French would pompous no as the yeah as it's referred to um i do i really enjoy getting out there and and being in the countryside and you know tasting a flask of tea and some sandwiches and uh you know i like to take my binoculars and see if i can spot some interesting wildlife you do find actually particularly if you go if you go very rural with with your painting is because you do tend to sit quite still and you do tend to be a little bit quiet you do tend to see a lot of wildlife um normally if i you know if i'm walking i've got the dog with me and she will flush game um, not always in the best way if you want to actually watch it um if you're with other people you you know you're you're not quite as paying as much attention as perhaps you would be if you're on your own or you could be talking and obviously you know if you're running or something you'll startle a lot of wildlife before it comes up um, whereas if you're sitting and just really quietly painting it, it's lovely. You know, you do see a lot. So I think what I've done here is I've is is I've actually just put a a really light wash over that, like a light orange. And then I'm going in with a little bit of purple, and I'm just creating. A sort of shadow zone really down that side of the lighthouse
shadows are always interesting things um, and can often be can often fool you you know there's an awful lot of science in terms of complementary colors and shadow colors and you know there's a you should if you're gonna put shadow on a lemon then you need to use purple and um, all that I think is really interesting and a lot of those kind of lessons I guess I have learned through experience but I still need to remind myself quite often by looking at a picture mainly after I've done it and going that's not right there why is that not right and then looking at a color wheel and trying to sort of figure it out um, color theory is definitely something that you know YouTube was almost made for uh, there's an awful lot of stuff out there about complementary colours, and you can find most of that information on YouTube. And to a certain extent, I know it'd probably benefit me to refresh myself and do a video about it, but it's not really that interesting for me. Uh, I like the the art. Uh, I might do something on that though at some point. So one of the things is I think about quite a bit with, with things like watercolour is that when you're looking at that scene, you're not painting. There isn't some darker blades of grass in the foreground, but what you can see is more of the shadows in the foreground. So it, you, what you're doing is you're painting the shadows. So you, you're looking at the, the shadows within the grass and painting those darker shadows. So uh, here, as you can see, you know I'm basically painting dark grass. But is that right? Because are the shadows that shape? You know, if you zoom in and look at the shadows in and around that grass, are they that shape? And that's one of the, the lovely things is there's always more to discover. There's always more to, to think about. So yes, I mean, this is the bit where we start to do some fast uh, uh, fast bits of detail to try and pull the foreground out, bring it forward, and, uh, and really, you know, sharpen everything up in the foreground a little bit, and that helps push that depth in. I think actually you could go a little bit further on this. It needs a little bit more shadow and some dark areas under the... Uh, uh, some of the woodwork, you know, the sort of banister, if you know what I mean, on the wood, on the, the boardwalk. And, um, yeah, I think it could go, you could go with more detail on it, but to a certain extent, I'd be very surprised if I do a lot more on this, because it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of there, if you know what I mean. If I squint... Which is always nice if you narrow your eyes and look at something with your eyes slightly narrowed, it gives you a good, uh, yeah, good overall feel. But yeah, it's quite fun, really. I think the palette turned out okay. I think I could have gone a little bit more purpley, a little bit darker, overall darker, a little bit more pigmented. Um, the lighthouse looks a little bit light, I would say. And it could be darker on one side. And obviously I could have used an orange Posca pen to sort of capture the feel of the light. Uh, overall could have been slightly darker on the ground. Uh, but yeah, it's fine. A bit washy. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, it's a good one to try. Um, you know, try by starting building those layers up and then as you get in the foreground adding in a bit of detail and you know don't worry too much about the background uh it doesn't it doesn't need to be that complicated so yeah i hope you enjoyed that like and subscribe and uh, we'll see you again next time have a great night